welcome all of you uh, to our program. This is uh, the Caritas Consciousness Project, and I'm Gloria Guidi. And uh, Caritas is, for those of you not familiar with us, we are dedicated to the evolution of consciousness uh, individually and collectively. And we do this by drawing from a wide assortment of both ancient and leading edge traditions and philosophies to provide presentations and classes and study groups in the service of evolving consciousness as the key to individual growth and global healing. We sure need some global healing these days. Uh, we've been doing this for the past 18 years. And in 2019, we began recording our presentations. I think we have about, oh, I don't know, more than 80 recordings. Uh, our video recordings are viewable through our website, which is caritascenter.org, and also on our YouTube channel, which is Caritas Consciousness Project. And when you go to the YouTube channel and you put in Caritas Consciousness Project, you'll see it come up, and then you have to click on it to see all of our videos. Otherwise, it's a mixture of our videos and other people's videos. Um, so when you when you uh, when you bring it, when you see the logo, click on it and rely on the support of our members and donors to keep our program going. So if you enjoy our presentations and would like to support this program, we would be very grateful and you can make a donation or become a member on our website. Now let me introduce tonight's guest speaker, uh, Father Nathan Castle. Uh, has helped more than 400 stuck and not so stuck souls who died suddenly and traumatically to adjust to the afterlife. Victims of fires, autom automobile ap accidents, shootings, stabbings, drownings, and suicides come to him in his dreams seeking help to res resolve their interrupted death experiences. Father Nathan believes that providing such help is something the Holy Spirit has given him and his prayer partners to do. And in his Afterlife Interrupted books, Father Nathan is quick to point out that not everyone who dies suddenly gets stuck. That's an important point. He also addresses questions like, is death survivable? What does he do to help people cross over? Does time exist in the afterlife? Do deceased relatives help us adjust to moving through our deaths? Um, Father Nathan is originally from Groves, Texas. He graduated from Trinity University in San Antonio and entered the Dominican order in 1979. Father Nathan received an MA and M a Master's of Divinity degrees from the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. He served in campus ministries at Arizona State University, Stanford, and UC Riverside for 27 years. He came to Stanford in 2007 and served as pastor director of the Catholic community at Stanford. Father Nathan has chaired the executive board of the Catholic Campus Ministry Association. Uh, he enjoys golf, spending time with friends, and cheering on his favorite sports teams, especially Stanford football and Houston Astros baseball. Okay, so welcome, Father Nathan, and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this evening. Oh, hi, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to see you. And I have lots of questions to ask you. And I want to show, oh, let me do this first. Here is um, Father Nathan's first book. And let me share my screen and I will show you his second book on this subject, because he did write another book. This one is a little easier to see, but you can see Afterlife Interrupted book two. Okay, and, um, and the other one looks just like it, except it's book one. So um, let's see, Father Nathan, 
Um, I have lots of questions and um, I think our audience will too. And I want to start with, uh, in your book, I read the first one. I didn't read the second one yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also quite interested in your book on the Wizard of Oz, which is called M. Toto 2. There it is. <laughs> and he has his own Toto. I do. In his lap. <laughs> um, in your book, you mentioned that your guardian angel's name is Philip James of the line of Michael. And I'm wondering, did you come to know him when you began this, what you call your night job, which is helping the stuck souls, since you have other duties as priest, right? Um, yes. So did, did you come to know him when you began this work, helping souls cross over, or were you always aware of him? Well, I was raised a Catholic child, um, and not just with the rules and regulations of, of organized religion, but with the spirit of things. And I was taught about my guardian as a little kid, I mean, really early. And so I, I prayed to my guardian because I was taught to, and I had that relationship. I think I let it lapse somewhere around the time I was 10 or 11. Uh, but then when I was the first time pastor in my early 30s, about well, 30 years ago or 35 years ago, I was in a, I was having a lot of trouble pastoring this particular church. There was a lot of fighting going on. And I could, these people were twice my age, but I couldn't get them to stop fighting. And mm -hmm. uh, I went to a spiritual director who encouraged me to uh, ask if I prayed to my guardian angel. I said, I quit many years ago. And he said, well, why don't you start again? Mm -hmm. And I did. And, uh, and uh, I, I'd gotten to know um my church was named St. Andrews. It was the Newman Center, the Catholic campus ministry at UC Riverside in Southern California. And I was taught to pray to St. Andrew. Well, Andrew's named Andrew, but I didn't know the name of my guardian. So I was praying to both of them. And I just said, you know, I can talk, I can call Andrew by name, but guardian, I, I don't know what to call you, uh, if, but I'd like to be able to call you by name. If somewhere between today and my deathbed, if I could know your name, that'd be sweet. And a lady showed up. Uh, a few days before Christmas at, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, light came out of her eyes during the mass while I was saying mass. It got my attention like a bolt of light right across the room. I waited for her at the end of the service. She waited for me and she told me she had my Christmas present. And she, she didn't even live there. She lived 20 miles away, but she drove 20 miles. She was, she was told that the, the Lord said, go to Riverside, find Father Nathan at St. Andrews and tell him you've got his Christmas present. I said, well, where is it? I don't see anything. And she said, it's the name of your guardian angel. Have you been praying to know it? I said, yeah, I started, you know, back around Easter. And she said, well, you don't have to believe me, but it's Philip James of the line of Michael and he's a warrior. So oh. that's, uh, and wow. I went home and she taught me, she told me right away, now you shouldn't believe this because I say so, you don't even know me. Um, uh, but when you when you have a chance, pray on it and discern it. And I just thought, what difference would it make if I called my guardian by the wrong name? It wouldn't ruin anything. <laughs> I'm right. Doing the best I know how. Uh, but I did go home and I prayed and I asked him, "Is this your name?" And he swooshed through me. Uh, ah. And so uh, uh -huh. that's all I needed to know. Yeah. Yeah, it's not um, it, it's not imperative that we know the name of our guardians, but. Uh, in the work that I do, we often ask the guardian who guards the, the soul that we're helping that day. Mm -hmm. And very often they come on the line first. I allow them to speak through me mm -hmm. only after protected prayer with St. Michael the Archangel and mm -hmm. Mary and a bunch of the holy ones. But um, very often the guardian will come on first just to break the ice. I mm -hmm. call it a mic test. You know, mm -hmm. is this thing on? Can you hear me in the back? Because uh, th these souls have never probably never spoken through somebody else's voice before. So it's a new yeah. thing. Yeah. Their guardian can set them at ease a little bit by showing them how easy it is. Yes. So you're probably used to speaking to a Catholic audience, um, whereas our audience includes a lot of people who are familiar with this subject through having studied spiritism, which mm -hmm. uses different terminology, sure. uh, but does a lot of the same work, right? Right. So I might occasionally ask you about semantics. For instance, 
when you use the term gift of prophecy in the book, do you mean revealing the will of God as biblical prophets did, or is it more in the nature of the ability to allow a speak, a speak a spirit sorry, to speak through you? It's uh, the what second. we would call channel, channeling. Yeah, I just avoid channeling because in my Roman Catholic world, uh, it's radioactive. There's just no, uh, <laughs> really? there's no reason to use language that is so off-putting in, uh, in this uh -huh. subculture. So I, I try yeah. to, uh, and I'm trying to stay a Catholic priest in good standing and not be a former Catholic priest. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. The words matter, you know? What does it matter? What you call it doesn't matter. Well, and, you know, I, but I do believe uh, if, if, if uh, you're familiar with the writings of St. Paul that are in the New Testament, he often lists different spiritual gifts and prophecy is one of them. And one of the ways that prophecy manifests, for example, in a charismatic prayer group mm -hmm. is that someone allows uh, speech through that um, is interpreted by someone else in the room, mm -hmm. allowing, allowing the voice to be used by one of the holy ones or God is, uh, it belongs to the gift of prophecy, I think. Right. Right. Um, I loved the story of when you, as a child, met JFK in spirit. Uh, yeah. Would you tell that story? I would. Um, I was uh, I was growing up in Southeast Texas in a little Catholic school, uh, and uh, you know the nuns especially were over the moon about the fact that he was the first Catholic president, and uh, his picture was on the wall next to Jesus and the Pope. They were all three in a row, uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was for, for, you know, being that young, I paid a lot of attention to world events, you know, the mm -hmm. year or two before we'd had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we were not very far from Cuba on the, the Texas Gulf Coast, and I don't know, I just paid attention, and um, I had the custom of praying for people who had died because I was taught to, mm -hmm. uh, Catholics, uh, uh, at least in my training, I was taught that there's heaven, hell, and purgatory, and that most people go to purgatory because not everybody's ready for heaven just the second that they die, and that uh, they might have to wait, and they might, and but we can make it faster for them if we pray for them. Mm -hmm. And one of my, both of my aunts were first grade teachers, and they belong to the same order that I now belong to. Both of my dad's siblings were Dominican first grade teachers, and one of them came to me before my first communion and said, and my name at the time was Robert. Uh, she said, now, Robert, I have to tell you something very important. You must listen. Um, God loves everybody and hears everybody's prayers, but the prayers of children go straight to God's heart and you won't be a child for very long. So she didn't use the word superpower, but that was what was conveyed. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have this ability while you're a child to pray prayers that go straight to God's heart. So pray for everything and everybody you can think of. And um, I got involved in praying for the souls in purgatory. We used to get newspapers in the morning and the evening, and they both had obituaries in them. And I would look for the ones that weren't Catholic because it usually said at the bottom what church their funeral was going to be in. And I would pray for the non-Catholic ones because I figured the Catholic ones probably have their own family that prays for them, but the Baptist wouldn't even know to do it. So, so I just, stopped. <laughs> I prayed for everybody else. And I, I, I went, to, we used to go to the bank because my dad uh, took up, made, uh, my parents made, uh, we had passbook savings accounts for college and you'd have to go to the bank and go through those zigzaggity rope things, you know, yeah. and wait like your turn. And I thought purgatory must be like that, that they know <laughs> you, 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 you're already in the bank, but you're not at the front. And so I thought, well, I, I, but you could cut in line if somebody prayed for you. So uh -huh. I was all about prompt customer service in purgatory as a little kid. <laughs> I'd pray for the fir first one, the one that needed one more prayer. And then I'd pray for whoever just got there. Um, but that's, but I digress. You asked about John Kennedy. <laughs> no, well, that was great background. Well, we came in from big recess. It was, he was shot at 1230. Uh, and we had just had come in from recess and the other second grade teacher came running into the room screaming, you know, teachers don't do that around little kids. She was just right. like hinged. She came running and screaming saying the president's been shot and our teacher tried to calm her down. And then they made us kneel next to our desks and pray, pray, pray for the president. Well, um, you know, and then they quit having school because everybody was too upset. So they sent us home and, um, 
you know, over the, the weekend was so weird. Anybody that was alive at that time, you know, the, uh, there was nothing on TV for a child except people crying from all over the world. And, mm -hmm. and then we, I came in from watch, playing football on the lawn to watch Lee Harvey Oswald get murdered on TV, mm -hmm. like right in the living room. It was live. Uh, uh, and I remember I, I watched it too. Um, and then the next day, of course, was all of that, you know, remarkable. It was a Catholic mass and, you know, the, the horse with no rider and the, the, I, I was, I was very intrigued by the eternal flame. I'd never known of a flame that didn't go out and how in the world do you make it not ever go out? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a seven-year-old, I was watching all these things. And then that night we were going to go to school on Tuesday. They didn't have school on Monday. But that night I decided, you know what, I haven't even, I normally pray for the people who have died and I didn't even pray for the president after mm -hmm. he died. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. So I was in my bed, I was you know, on the edge of sleep or whatever. And when I prayed for him, I could see him and mm -hmm. he could see me. And um, I can remember it vividly. I'm almost 66 and I was seven at the time, but I know it happened. Mm -hmm. I, could, I, I could feel his heart. Um, he wasn't angry that he was murdered. He was colossally sad because he felt like he had disappointed everyone. Mm. And I didn't know why. I just knew that he felt that he had disappointed everyone and he, and he wanted to be left alone. And so I just looked at him and he looked at me and I kind of waved to acknowledge him and then, you know, went on my way. But in the spirit ever since then, uh, he's been one of my touchstones. One of my, I call him my posse. He, <laughs> he's helped a few people cross actually. Really? He shows up once in a while. To, to, huh. yeah. how, how, how nice to have to be crossed over by JFK. When a cele now, it's not often that the celebrities get involved, but these people have all been through trauma and some of them uh, might have had their had major struggles even before their violent death. And sometimes the fact that a celebrity comes to them just makes them impressed with themselves like oh my god you know, I must be more than there there must be more to me than I thought if you're showing up to mm -hmm. make this it could be really sweet when that happens that's nice yeah um how long generally speaking has it been since the soul you're helping left the body like how long after they die is there a typical time or does it vary tremendously it varies, but I would say um, all but maybe about 5% have been people that were alive either during my lifetime or um, in the decade or two before it. So people from maybe the 1930s forward. I was born in 56. Uh -huh. uh, once in a while, it's persons from longer ago than that, but that's pretty infrequent. And then it doesn't always come up right away because it isn't essential to what we're doing. But yeah. sometimes maybe we should back up just a little bit and explain the basics of the, the kind of the trajectory. Okay. Um, this started about 25 years ago, but the pattern is that I'll be asleep and I, I consecrate my sleep before I go to sleep. And I say to the Lord, I'm available for your, like, you know, for whatever you might want of me during the night. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, about once a week, someone will come with what I call a contact dream which is not the same as my own psychobabble. So mm -hmm. you might imagine then six days a week, I'm dreaming about my own issues and stuff. And then once in a while, I'll have one that somebody moves in and it, they play sort of like a little video. And it's normally a violent scene of their death, but it's, it's um, muted or um, buffered in a way that doesn't uh, shock or horrify. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it gets across the detail that they were in a car crash or a drowning or whatever it was that occurred. Mm -hmm. I write it down in a, a book that I keep on the nightstand because I know now to do that. You never know when, whether there's going to be one. And then um, I make an appointment with some prayer partners and I try not to let it go for more than about a month to six weeks. It just depends. They come at the rate of about one a week. And in fact, tomorrow morning, I have an appointment with two of my prayer partners on Zoom, and we will do two crossings normally in, in one two-hour session. So when you have two prayer partners um, online, 
what one of or do they both do the dialogue or does one of them channel in you i do i do the i bring i do the uh the, the speaking the through voice. and okay. then um one of them takes the lead and the other one acts as the kind of the background person they mm-hmm. they, they agree among themselves who's going to be the lead today or in, in this one and background uh, person does does that person do anything Sometimes they chime in. They're they're at least present and they're acknowledged. We say hi to each other. Um, the ones that I'm using tomorrow are in Southern California and in Buffalo, New York. But we all come on a Zoom call at the same time and it works just fine. I was and so pandemic, it's been a blessing because you know I haven't been able to to be with a lot of people you know without travel. I was so inspired by the fact that you do it online because we we did similar work, um, we call it spirit release work or disobsession work um, at, at, at the center. Um, but we always did it in person, of course. And when the yes. pandemic hit and we no longer, we went completely virtual, uh, we just assumed that we couldn't do it anymore or at least not until we could get together again. And, and, uh, and now we're, we're inspired by your work to, to do it online. And we always have a third person who is channeling energy, healing to, oh, the, okay. to the spirit, to the soul, um, to help it to um, raise, kind of raise its vibration and be more open to what we're saying to them. So well, you mentioned curious. earlier about, you, about different language. Uh, Catholics would yes. call it intercessory prayer. Someone, someone intercedes and I have a, a woman in New York City that intercedes while we're she's not on the call but she she knows the basics of what was in the dream and she that's her contribution I see I see yeah um so uh in the story of Ray the perfect gentleman you call it was his uh, nickname or his description. Um, would you tell that story? I, I really like that story. And, and then I'll ask you a question or two about, about it. Could you, sure. you mind there's telling There's been maybe about 400 of these over the last 25 years, and he was the first. So yes. I tell this story often. Um, I was on a retreat, and I live in Arizona. I was up in the mountains in the northern part of the state on a retreat, which I was offering for a group of people, including a friend of mine who was pretty spiritually gifted in ways that would be familiar with a group like yours. Mm-hmm. And during the night, I was having a dream about finishing a round of golf with another priest, going into the bar, um, a- anticipating just having a beer, and uh, we stumbled into a silent auction. And so, so far, this is all my dream stuff. I've run charities my whole life. Uh, fundraising is a part of it. But on the wall, there was a, an opposite me. There was, it was before televisions were on walls, but there was a, there was a framed piece of art that was just horrid. And I, I called my partner's attention to it and said, look at that God awful thing over there. Who would give that to a charity? And, but it was so horrible. I needed to get a closer look. Mm-hmm. And so I went toward it and it came toward me. And we met in the middle and then inside the frame, a little film began to play. And it was of a, a man on a car from the late fifties or early sixties, the kind with fins and lots of Chrome. He was sitting on the radiator facing away from the car with his feet on the bumper. So he wasn't in a car crash, but somehow he caught fire on the engine of a car. Mm. And he was screaming in agony as he died and angry at somebody outside the picture frame. And I woke up. I I knew even before I was fully awake that this was not my dream, that it was something else. And it was somebody in agony. And so I sat up and I said a prayer right away. And I said, here's what I just saw. Don't go, don't leave yet, whoever you are. (laughs) I I think this is what I got and I'm going to write it down. And uh, and then I went back to sleep. And when I got up that morning, I found my friend and just said, could we, um, on a break or something, could we, could we find a little privacy and pray for this guy and see what might be going on? And uh, then things started happening. He, 
she said, well, he really wants to talk to you. Would you mind if I let him? And she could. And I said, well, yeah, we're, we've done our protected prayer. And I, you know, I'm not trying to get tomorrow's lottery numbers. I'm not playing mm-hmm. with Ouija boards or, you know, dabbling in anything. I just try to help if somebody's suffering and out of him, out of her came his voice. And he said, who the hell does he think he is taking me just when my life was getting good. And so um, I just said, well, hello, my name is Nathan. And <laughs> I'm the person whose dream you came into. And this is my friend and we will do what we can to help you. Um, he, he seemed to understand that there was a God, which is a good thing because it's true. And I said, how did you even know that? And he said, well, uh, my mom, she used to make me kneel next to my bed and pray. And while I did, she beat me. So I thought, well, why did she do that? Well, I don't know. She just did. And I said, well, who taught you that God takes people? And he said, well, that was brother James. I said, well, who was he? Well, he was my pastor. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, I bet he was doing the best he knew how, but I'm a pastor too. And I just think that's nonsense. In fact, I said he was full of shit. So I said, uh, that's just crazy talk. Uh, that's not the way that, way that it works. But uh, we wanted to, we just said, how can we help you? What is it that you want? And he said, it's my wife. Um, he had died in 1960. It was now in the late 1990s, maybe 2000. He had been watching her for 40 years after his death. And now she'd married up, married her a lawyer, moved from Georgia to South Carolina, didn't have any more kids, don't have any great um, gripe with that man. He's done a fine job raising my son, but my wife's dying of cancer and I want to greet her when she crosses, but I can't the way I am. So I said, well, it sounds like we need to get you, something needs to change and we need to help you change if you want to see your wife. Is that the, the story? And he said, yes, sir. And I said, well, what have you been doing for the last 40 years? And he said, nothing much. <laughs> he, was, he was just so angry that in his afterlife, world he just created an isolation chamber because he didn't want to be around anybody uh, so um have any questions so far or should i just yeah, when he said uh, i can't the way i am did he mean his physical appearance or what did he mean do you know i don't know i just you know that's what he said so i said well i don't know what that means yet but i bet we'll find out you know mm-hmm. we'll we'll work on it and and i said you know Cancer's got you, you haven't, you don't have very much progress at all to show for 40 years from the sound of it. And now you want to hurry to greet your wife and we'll help you hurry. But remember, cancer has its own schedule. We can't afford to take some slow and steady path if, if you really want this to happen the way you say you do. So we might have to push you and people generally don't like being pushed. Um, so if at any point you uh, uh, want to opt out all you have to do is say so but we're going to kind of push because it sounds like that's what we need to do to help you and so over about we met for maybe an hour he agreed, hour. He, agreed. he said okay. yes he did he yeah. did um and we we uh, we didn't have a manual for how to do this we just tried mm-hmm. to use common sense and uh and listen and and think mm-hmm. and um so at one point we decided well it seems like it ought to be if you're going to move from a place where you haven't moved in 40 years, we probably ought to invite somebody else to come and show you around a little bit or go for a walk or something, get out a bit and mm-hmm. show that you can move. And uh, said, so, you know, uh, is there somebody we, we, we thought, well, maybe his mom, but no, his mom beat him. Maybe that's not the best idea. Mm-hmm. What about your dad? And he said, well, I didn't really know him. He died when I was 10 in the war. And I said, Vietnam. He said, no, Korea. And I said, well, Uh, did you ever have a really good time together? Uh, I've done a lot of counseling and that's one of the things you do when people go dark. When -hmm. people go dark, you try to help them go light. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you you were kind of afraid of him and he died when you were 10. Did you ever have a great time together? And he said, yeah, one time we went and looked at cars and I said, well, what if it, it, would it be okay? What do you think about maybe we ask him to come and see you and make, make, maybe you draw a line so he can't come too close so that you can look him over and see if he, if he feels safe. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you tell him he can't stay too long, um, do, but would it be okay if we, we invited him? And he said, yeah, that'd be all right. So I said, well, I'm going to say a prayer because I'm a priest. And he said, a priest? Oh, shit. I said, well, <laughs> sorry, you got a priest. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, um, 
and I'm going to just, I'm not going to make a big deal of it. I'm just going to say, God, would you please send Ray's dad if he's available and would like to come. And within, you know, 10 seconds, he said, wow, look at you there. And I said, I can't see what you see what you're seeing, but I said, what's my dad? And I said, well, do you feel safe? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, does he look scary? No, he just looks like my dad. So I said, well, do you, do you, is it okay for him to take you for a walk uh, just to, to get you in circulation? And he said, yeah, that'd be okay. I said, okay, well then we're going to leave the two of you, you go do what you want and we'll see you in a week or so. And uh, it took three sessions, but mostly I, I, I told him at one point, I think I know what the problem is. It's every time you talk about this woman, you sound like a caveman. <laughs> You sound like if you saw her, you'd grab her by her hair and drag her into your cave. You know, um, she's, you're not the only person that's loved her and she's lived 40 more years. Surely there's going to be other people that died or that would like to see her too. You shouldn't just assume that you're going to have a private little audience. Uh, there's probably going to be a few people and you're the only person she had a child with and you're one of only two husbands and the only one that's died. You're certainly important. Just don't act like you're the whole show. Just be a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And he didn't like that, but I said, you don't have to like it. Remember, I'm just, and, may, and I could be wrong, but I just think maybe if you calm down a little bit, and if you were a little more humble about wanting to greet her, uh, rather than feeling entitled to, to it, maybe that would help. So anyway, the, the third and final time that we saw him, we said, hey, Ray, uh, you know, it's been a week, how are you doing? And he said, big news, my wife passed. And I said, oh, well, that is big news. Well, how did it go? And he said, well, uh, it was kind of like you said, I wasn't the only one, but there was a few people and, uh, and, and she crossed and I got to be there when she crossed. And she's, then he said, you would have been proud of me. I was a perfect gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> he was a 20 year old, uh, kind of angry young man that died in a fire and worked on cars. Uh, but he said, I was a perfect gentleman. And so I said, well, that's terrific. Great. Right? Now, you know how to help people cross. And I think our work here is finished. Uh, probably time for you to go on to whatever else you, is you're going to do. And um, I said, you know, it felt like saying goodbye to an old friend that I had never even seen. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, but I said, well, now, you know, before you leave, now that you know how to help people cross, I wonder, and you know how to watch people because uh, you've been doing that for 40 years. Would you watch me at least from time to time? And as it gets closer from my time to cross, would you mind being there to greet me? And he said, why, sir, I would be most honored. Just look for the perfect gentleman. <laughs> but didn't he say that he was going to help other people? He was going to learn how to help other people cross? That was secondarily. We, we don't share any of these stories uh, in public and print or any other way unless we get their permission. And that yeah. involves going back to them a second time just to ask that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't chat them up or, you know, stay in long, you know, yeah. uh, uh, me uh, meetings with with people that have passed uh there's always a next one and so i'm on to the you know helping the next mm -hmm. one but we did ask him uh, if he, we could use his story and when we did we didn't just get a yes or no answer it's in book one the, the transcripts are all there it's right there yeah. for the public uh, mm -hmm. but he said once i learned he said you know what the problem was i was in school all the time and in school they're always teaching you stuff you don't want to know and uh, uh, and i didn't like school and it didn't like me but now, uh, but then when I learned how to be a, a person who could help people cross, I thought, here's finally something I'd like to know more about. And, and so he, he said that out loud and they said, well, would you like to come to this school that we have to help people do it? And he said, sure, I'd like that. So that's what I, I haven't talked to him since. Um, mm -hmm. But the last uh, we had heard of him, he was uh, he was in some sort of a school where he could get better at helping people be greeted when they crossed. Mm hmm. Yeah, I like that story, um, particularly because he found some productive work to do yeah. in the afterlife. Because a lot of these uh, souls, when you follow up with them, it sounds like they're just having a good time and enjoying themselves. And I wondered, is that because they're still recovering from trauma that they're not given any, any kind of you know, productive. Well, many of them are given productive work. Remember, I, you, you've only read the first book and that's 13 yeah. stories. There's a second book with 13 more and then I have about 400. So there's a whole lot that aren't in print. But okay. many times, even between the time that um, that they come in a dream and when we maybe several weeks pass before we can get to them, mm -hmm. they tell me that um, that they've been invited to turn 
towards somebody sort of behind them in the line. <laughs> Toto, come here. <laughs> come here, buddy. Boom. Come up here. Boom. Oh, there you go. <laughs> somebody was walking a dog. That sets them off. Um, uh, very often they're told to turn around and help somebody that, uh, that needs some help that they know how to provide. Um, were you ever in a school where the, um, the, the eighth grader is in charge of a family with a sixth grader and a fourth grader and a second grader. Uh, uh, when, uh, in a Catholic school system, they'll often bring the whole school to a mass. So now oh. all of these children have to have church manners at the same time. And one of the ways that they do it is they put them in these groupings because they'll be uh, quieter or more respectful with another student in charge of them rather than an adult. I see, yeah. Huh. It's not the same old adult saying sit up straight and that kind of thing. Right, right. <laughs> they yeah, don't want to make the eighth grader you know, correct them. Uh, yeah. Anyway, there's there's a way in which they don't uh -huh. need to, they've learned something and they, they turn around and, and help somebody right. else. Right. <laughs> we didn't have that in the Catholic school that I went to, but, uh, but in high school, um, and it was a, a Catholic high school, Dominican Academy, as a matter of fact, uh, in New York, um, we had, when you were a freshman, you had a senior sister. It was yeah. an all girl school. So we had a senior sister and she kind of took you under her wing and, you know, helped you. So maybe that might be the equivalent to. A lot of the one, when we do the ask, ask their permission to use their story and we get these little follow-up stories, a lot of them are in some sort of formal training. Uh-huh. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. There, one of them explained, you're, ne you're never the only person that wants to know something. And there's going to be somebody else beside you that wants to know the same thing. And so they just put us together in groups, just like they do on earth. Mm -hmm. and, and you learn together about whatever you want to know. That's great. Yeah. Um, and I like the fact that you went back to each soul whose story you wanted to include in the book and you asked their permission to have their story told. And it was also an opportunity to get an update on what they've been up to in the spirit world since they crossed over. Um, even though that wasn't the purpose, right. it was an interesting, you know, opportunity. So, and how much earth time would you say had elapsed between crossing the soul over and recontacting them? A um, matter of months, maybe, or months. a year. Okay. under two years mm -hmm. um, uh, i'm i'm thinking of a, a third book in this series and i have so many stories to choose from it i might be going a little further back uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it doesn't seem to matter yeah right yeah they've also said that um there's something about levels i don't know you you said that you're from the uh, many of you are from this is it spirit spiritist or spiritism Spiritism, uh, spiritism, spiritism. Yes. tradition. Did, in that, in that, in, in that tradition, is there a language of uh, vibration or levels? Yes, yes. Uh, Your frequency um, determines where you are in the afterlife. That's where what I've seen, and they they're they're assured that you can come back and visit where you already are. Yes. but there's sort of a ceiling. You can't go right. above this until this passage happens. Right. After higher, does, higher spirits can come down and visit you. Right. You no, know, you can always go down and visit lower levels, but uh, the lower levels can't always go up unless they have permission. That's you know. what I've seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. My little friend needs to leave the room. So. Okay. <laughs> go on your way. Go find Richard. Can I ask a question about Ray too? Because I read, I listened to that first book and I I was interested about Ray because it didn't seem like he really had crossed over because he hadn't gone anywhere. He hadn't done anything. So I was kind of confused. I thought maybe he was waiting to cross. And so how could he, how was he able to help his wife cross when he wasn't really equipped for it? You know, I just was confused about that. It seemed like he was it, stuck. It seemed to me that he was at least a spectator to it. Mm -hmm. I think that's really all he wanted. He wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. I don't know that well, he would have known how to help. Possible, do, do you think it's possible that he, in the interim from when you first started working with him, do you think it's possible that his guides on the other side might have 
helped him cross. And then, you know, he could still talk to you having crossed. It could be. All of these um, stories are very terse. Um, mm-hmm. And it, even though we're talking with them, we're, we're, um, we're on a mission. We're, we're, we're very task oriented. So they're not long protracted uh, casual conversations where mm-hmm. we're busy with a task, either crossing them or getting a yes or no answer. Mm-hmm. And, and the then, important thing too is that the the souls that you work with, they are all looking to cross. They're not resistant to crossing. Correct. That's a great point to make. They're I call them vetted. Mm-hmm. Um, they they come to me, not me to them. Wow. Uh, and that's my rule. Like today, I got some more email. Sometimes after being on co- podcasts and things people will essentially want me to be a medium and contact their deceased loved ones and get a mm-hmm. message through or stuff like that. And I just say, I'm sorry, that's not what I believe my vocation is. My calling is to do this specific work. And uh, I try to coach them into their own spiritual, uh, to, to teach spiritual practice where they can dispose themselves to be easier to reach, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. especially in sleep or in meditation. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't, uh, they come to me, and they're not brought to me and to my prayer partners until they're ready. So even there, but there's like with most things, there seems to be some sort of a gradient and a person can be barely ready. In fact, there's one young man that we call Daniel ready enough because <laughs> when, when he, he wanted to push and they said, and they, he, he was trying to say, I'm ready, I'm ready. And, and the people helping him were saying, well, you're only barely ready. And he said, but I'm ready enough. And so <laughs> they let him, they let him uh, go. And uh, there was another one like that. That was a sheriff that died. Uh, he was killed in the line of duty while somebody had just m- murdered his sister. He was mm-hmm. so angry uh, mm-hmm. and enraged. They shot her right in her house in a small town. And he thought he was supposed to be the sheriff and protect everybody. And it was his own sister that got murdered and he got mm-hmm. murdered in the same incident. He was so angry, but he um, he was he was uh, he he used kind of a thermometer idea about. They told him it, it almost like it. Uh, do any of you know your blood pressure numbers or some other number about your triglycerides or something? Mm-hmm. And you know he he knew he knew this number that the, that he needed to get below in order to be able to, to do this crossing, huh. and he was watching it like it was calibrated, and he knew that he was right on the cusp. And they said, well, all right, but you have to promise us if you're going to go into that man, you can't go into him and be all angry. Uh-huh. We've taught also, you how to calm down. Corresponded to like emotional. To his, uh, to his anger. Uh, I see, to his anger. Uh-huh. Especially the way that anger can sometimes make us irrational and make us yeah. to poor decisions. Right. And, uh, they do, were trying to get him to calm down to the point where he was uh, making good choices. Mm-hmm. And they said, you can't come. We're not going to let you go into that man uh, and be all angry. You have to promise <laughs> us that you'll be on your best behavior. And they reminded him that he was a public servant. You know, you, you were a sheriff after all. You know better than oh. storming about just because you're angry. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, that's the way that worked. Was that in the second book? I think so. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, have you ever thought about... Um, what you would want to do in the afterlife you don't have to pick one thing it's it's (laughs) eternal after all you can do you can do one thing after another um yeah yeah, i have had some ideas uh if if, just earthbound stuff i love history and i particularly love social history Mm -hmm. not just battles and kings and queens and stuff but what it was like to live in this at that time i thought um i'd love to know some of my relatives better and know my ancestors and not just about them, but maybe they could take me along, take me mm-hmm. back to where they were. Mm-hmm. So some sort of a backward time travel. Mm-hmm. Um, I have all kinds of friends that are in the afterlife that I want to visit and catch up with. And then mm-hmm. I want to be of service. I want to say mm-hmm. to, to God, um, after I, I presume that there's some sort of opportunity for rest and regrouping after your death. Oh, yes. But, um, so I wouldn't like, 
agitate for you it must put me right back to work but bef- right. when, once once i got sufficient rest i i start looking around for how can i be helpful yeah yeah, yeah. one thing i already yeah. do um uh are you familiar with the phrase the lower astral the lower astral yes yeah mm-hmm. um some might think of that in, in terms of hell but but hell can be problematic in that some people think that it's eternal for everybody and there's no way out and it's a big punitive cell. Um, but I, I, I pray a lot for people that, um, that did awful things and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, notorious people. And so on. I, I, that's a mission of mine that several nights a week, I pray for folk that, um, that are in the news as uh people mm-hmm. that did horrible stuff i just that's an interest of mine because i believe everybody has a story and that whoever that person is was once a baby in arms yeah. <laughs> there was hitler was oh, once upon a time you know yeah. a little baby I always think of uh, something the dalai lama says which is um everybody is looking to be happy and avoid suffering and i think that we just have crazy strategies that even the serial killer somehow in his twisted mind thinks this is how I can be happy this is how I what I need to do to avoid suffering you know right and so yeah my training is is through Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas and they they both teach that that human wrongdoing is always the pursuit of a good Mm -hmm. robbing a bank is the pursuit of a good but it's an apparent but not actual good. Right, right. Stealing somebody else's money looked like a good idea at the time, but it really wasn't, it never was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but people can convince themselves or have other people convince them all the time of the rightness of what's wrong. And, and eventually they do have to own up to, to that if they're gonna progress. Yeah, I like that. It's in pursuit of the good. Um, Let's see. I might get a lamp from the other side of the room. It's get, uh, the sun is setting here, and I'm getting yeah, you're getting a little dark. dark. I'm gonna <laughs> okay. keep talking. I can hear you. Okay. Um, I imagine that in your seminary training, uh, you, that your seminary training didn't include a class in talking with uh, ghosts. <laughs> you must be psychic. You're right. <laughs> No, there was. I didn't. You're I didn't very good that. at it. You're very good at it. Psychologically speaking, you just uh, uh, you know just have to talk to them. Well, they're just people. Exactly. You know how to talk it's to Peter people. Schwartz says they're formerly physical people. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> um, so when you are allowing a soul to speak through you. Are you completely conscious of what is being said, of the conversation? Are you completely conscious or? Yes, I am. You are. Okay. Yeah. I think that's important in this type of. I call it co-conscious. And there's some parts to it where um, this, this this allowing, even when I preach, I don't believe that when I preach at a public service at Catholic Mass, I'm not giving a speech. I know how to give a speech, but that's not what you do at public worship. You're allowing God to speak to the people. Mm-hmm. And so I make myself available to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and say, use me, but speak through me. And you're not supposed to disappear and be a pipe or a wire. One long ago, the Lord said to me, Nathan, if I'd wanted you to be a pipe or a wire, I would have made you a pipe or a wire. <laughs> be who you are and let me move through you. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm conscious sometimes they can only use language that's in my vocabulary. Mm-hmm. They can't speak another language, but if, they, if they're speaking in another language, it will come out in English. Mm-hmm. I've, I've helped people that didn't know English and they even remark about it. An uh, uh, Iraqi man said, I would never have thought I'd be talking to an American, a Catholic and a priest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I don't even speak English. But, it, but all I need to do is form my thoughts and they come out this way. Yeah. So he was delighted with that. Uh, uh, okay, so um, 
have you ever investigated the story of one of your dream visitors to get more background information on the circumstances? Uh, are you moving in the direction of, can you prove it? You know, um, well, it, uh, it, not for the sake of proving it, but for the sake of understanding better, more than just that perspective on the situation. One of them died in an event that um, was in the news that all, all of us were aware of. Some, well, several died in 9-11, but that was, you know, 3,000 people. But mm -hmm. there was, there's another that uh, I, I could go online and find out more about. Um, I wonder the more, um, the longer that my story is in public and the more people like you expose me to new audiences, mm -hmm. if a day is coming when I um, try to get the kind of, what do they call it in mediumship? I, um, evidential stuff? Uh -huh. oh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that's more in the way of platform mediumship. I mean, we don't do that, but yeah. I'm also interested in working I, I'm at the University of Arizona. I live on the campus uh -huh. and I've been a campus minister most of my career. There's a lot of academic study of consciousness going on right now. Yeah. And some of it has to do with mediums uh, on our campus. There's, yeah, there's Gary Schwartz and, uh, and, and uh, the oh. Win, Winbridge Institute. There's, there's a lot of work there. Those people would, would want um, evidence. And yeah. if, if I felt like I'm, you know, I serve, God, who, who I know through the Catholic Christian construct of, I serve uh, Jesus the Christ and I and the Holy Spirit, and I just say I'm I'm your servant. I'm not charging off in on my own without direction. If you mm -hmm. want me to ever do that, you need to make it clear to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for right now, I think I've got my full plate, just helping the next person cross and mm -hmm. uh, speaking about it. A lot of a lot of Christian people don't believe in the afterlife. How can a Christian person not believe in the afterlife? They just don't. Uh, oh, they yes. just don't. I I I was before getting involved before writing these books. I was I I got I got about twenty five years into my campus ministry career. I was approaching sixty and thinking, I would, I, got, I want to do something else, and. I began writing and this turned out to be the something else. I wasn't really planning on the afterlife and all of these, you know, people being on shows like yours. Um, uh, but um, I was doing what's called a parish mission, which is, which is a thing in the Catholic church where somebody often a priest comes from out of town and teaches on a theme for three or four days in a row. Uh -huh. And really only a small subset of a congregation is interested in going to church on a Monday night, on a Tuesday mm -hmm. night, several nights in a row to do something special mm -hmm. uh, or, or even a Monday morning. Uh, so you're getting this really tight little subset. And I, I started asking them to close their eyes and tell me and tell themselves on a scale of 10 being strongest and one being weakest, where do they land on the question of the survivability of their own death? Will you be you after you die? Will you know that you died and that you're alive in a different way? They they pushed back like I had to I had to keep explaining it, and then I said, "Okay, enough already, everybody. We're just this is doesn't have to be this difficult. It, it, just close your eyes, and I mean you in the back. You know they they can be like children. You know you you ask them to close their <laughs> eyes, but they won't. And I said, "Well, I'm not going to. Uh, these people have right to privacy, and this is a private question. So if you can't close your eyes, leave the room. But if but but I want you to close your eyes and just tell me and yourself where you land. And mostly there would be very few tens. Even the pastor was not a 10. Usually the pastor was a nine. Um, uh, and it mostly landed around six. Wow. Much but then almost without fail, the lady that came early to put on the lights and start the coffee was a two. Oh, goodness. I just thought, how is this? So mm -hmm. I just felt like I found my mission, even inside the Catholic Church, was to yeah. teach what's called the Easter Proclamation. Hey, yeah. Jesus is risen from the dead. Did you hear about it? It was in all the papers. You know, it's, <laughs> and it's not just him. It's all of us. Uh, and oh, so, uh, and then since the pandemic, it opened up Zoom for me and churches closed down a lot. So 
uh, than before other audiences with this work? Well, they're in for a big surprise, I guess. And I've met some who were not, who didn't believe in an afterlife, who said, well, I was wrong. <laughs> <Here I am. laughs> right. Well, and, and I have met um, spirits who didn't believe in an afterlife and therefore they were convinced they weren't dead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we had to gently explain to them. Mm. Know, well, uh, remember, mine are all these vetted people, and most of them have been uh, through a healthcare continuum. I haven't really touched on that, but uh -huh. they belong to a category of people that needed extra help because they died suddenly in a car crash, or, mm -hmm. or they were murdered, or something awful, mm -hmm. and uh, went from alive one minute to dead the next. And so they've needed a continuum of care. Yeah. And they've been helped and coached by other people so that it's, I call us the discharge staff. We're, we're that social worker on the day that you're going to be released from the hospital that makes sure you understand your meds, uh, mm -hmm. your physical therapy, your next appointment, who's going to come for you. We, we just help them out the door and on to the, to the next, uh, mm -hmm. next thing. Yeah. Well, they're lucky to have you. Well, thanks. Um, there's a story of a mother who died leaving small children behind. I'm trying to remember her name. Uh, she wanted to know how she could still be part of their lives and support them. And, yes. uh, and you suggest that there, there must be training of that sort in the afterlife. Um, has any spirit ever elaborated on that? Yes, I have uh, not in a lot of detail, mm -hmm. but that um, that's a common enough experience that s I haven't parented a child of my own. My name is father and I put the finishing touches on other people's kids for years, you know, mm -hmm. 18 to tw 24 year olds at college. But um, for some people, when they die with young children, uh, they feel like their whole identity was or their life's mission was taken from them. Yeah. And, uh, and so, sometimes they're really upset and angry and so on. And in that woman's case, we just said, uh, she asked me that question is, is it, is it possible for me to still be involved in the lives of my children? And I said, sweetheart, you're asking the right question of the wrong person. Mm -hmm. you know, ask that, uh, turn around, uh, go to your guardian, ask, who, who could I go to to speak about this topic? And I'm sure you'll get the answer you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And she did. And she did. Uh, we, she's one that, that we didn't really become friends. Uh, I don't know if any of you, there's about a dozen of us on this call. Have any of you done counseling or some sort of uh, talk therapy kind of work or worked with the public in ways where you work with somebody and they kind of become a friend, even though you only met them as a, as a, client or mm -hmm. uh, something but once in a while people cross your path and you not only provide a service for them but you have a kind of an affinity uh, and a care for each other that might go beyond uh, what it is for somebody else that particular lady I'm thinking of didn't want anything of me after we let her you know, helped her cross mm -hmm. so uh, I have I don't really know she wasn't I wasn't somebody she confided in we were just helping her but mm -hmm. I believe that's the way it works mm -hmm. In the, uh, in the story of Hal, he describes reliving the event of his uh, car crash and tumbling yeah. inside the car over and over and over and over, which you describe as trauma looping. Yeah. Um, would you tell us more about that story? That was a fascinating one, I thought. Yeah, Hal was, um, he died in the 70s right about the time, do you remember when your car seat buzzed if you didn't buckle your seatbelt? Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people buckled them just to make the buzzer stop mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't put it around them or whatever. Mm -hmm. He did that. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was on a rain slick road uh, and the roads had been widened, but the bridges hadn't. And so the roads would narrow when they came to a bridge. And he, um, he, was, he said, I was going, I was, I was doing the same speed as the rest of the traffic, but we were all going too fast. And he came to a narrow spot and clipped a guardrail or abutment and ended up 
tumbling to, to his right off the road. And the last thing that he remembered was the tumbling. And in the way that his imagination worked, he kept doing that after the event was over. Yeah. Um, if any of you have worked with PTSD sufferers, um, that sometimes is why they don't sleep very well because they can rather control some of that during the day, but when they go unconscious and sleep, the event keeps recurring involuntarily. So right. um, yeah, that one, that happens a fair amount. I've dealt with, with trauma looping a fair amount, but the way out of it seems to be uh, their guardians and we encourage them, just take a short break. You know very well how to tumble. There's no question about it. You're excellent at that. Mm -hmm. would, would you pause for a moment and just do something else for 30 seconds and take a short break? And they can be encouraged to do that and can find it possible to do, even though the temptation to go back to the loop is strong, but it's something that they can kind of learn to use that muscle and, mm -hmm. uh, and eventually be able to see that, you know, I can tumble if I want, but I don't always want that. And in fact, I'm pretty sick of it. Yeah. And he, he did stop. He did. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, you know, the, the practice of um, asking the person, you know, is there someone who you loved and who loved you uh, who has crossed over or who died before you that you would like to see whom you would like to see? Um, that is such an effective uh, technique. <laughs> we use it a lot too. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's effective because they are the ones, we're not imposing that yeah, on yeah. them. You're not imposing that. You're asking them to name someone. And sometimes they name a celebrity. <laughs> and yeah, sometimes, yeah. Uh, sometimes they name a family member or a, a close friend, a grandmother, uh, you know, older sister, sometimes even a priest uh, who helped them, you know, and, and invariably, like magic, that person shows up. And I'm convinced that it's because, well, you know, these things are set up on the other side, and there's people helping and, you know, and, and it's not difficult for them to show up and they do especially if it's a loved one because they have been rooting for this person to cross right yes and, and sometimes they've even been actively watching and waiting yeah exactly they know that a loved one has has died and is not in the body any longer but it's not available to us yet because they uh haven't made haven't finished the crossing or done something you know right yeah yeah um, and so that's a, it's a beautiful thing to see, you know, when, when the soul sees the person and is just so delighted. And One person in the second book told me that, um, that after he crossed this was in the permission giving second time we spoke with him, he said, um, that when I did make this crossing, uh, it, it had been a long, it had been a while since I'd actually died and left the body, but I was treated here like a newbie because oh. I was, because mm -hmm. I wasn't available to them. And so they greeted me as though I had just died because they hadn't been able to greet me before. Mm -hmm. And then he said, I was, I was welcomed by a group at, all at once, but it was rather like late in the day mm -hmm. and after you've been traveling and everybody knows you're tired. And so there was, a, they sort of greeted me and welcomed me and were happy for me. And then they put me to bed. And then oh. when you get up the next morning, we'll, we'll have a nice breakfast and then we'll make a plan for the day and so on. So mm -hmm. he said, I'm, I'm somewhere around noon. He said, um, you know, I've rested and I haven't quite decided what we're going to do yet, but there's going to be a plan. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about drug abuse deaths. Yeah. Um, and you've had your share, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Um, and you mentioned in the book that after death, there's no more physiological dependence, but 
Uh, there are other things that need to be worked out. And I, I would say psychological dependence can linger. Right. Yes, and just habit. Yeah. Habits of any kind, once they're grooved, a, a habit of thought can go with you. Mm -hmm. And you just have habitual ways of doing a thing. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people will take away their own freedom uh, by allowing their habits to dominate. Yeah. Haven't you seen that in your own life? Is there any, any, any do you have some habit, Gloria, where, that you just default to it all the time and just th define yourself that way? That's what mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. uh, except mm -hmm. you can stop if you wanted. <laughs> do something yeah. else. Maybe. <laughs> Good uh, habits and bad habits. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and sometimes um, people that got, sometimes drug abuse was preceded by depression. Oftentimes yeah. uh, taking a drug to change uh, uh, psychological states is because there was already some great sadness or something. So sometimes it, the, some of that work is very much like what, what would happen in a 12-step program or a good... Um, uh, therapeutic hospital or something. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's, it's coming to truth. Yeah. And, and the truth of your own goodness and the truth of your freedom. Um, In your experience, do, uh, do those souls um, express remorse for having wasted their lives and caused you know, a lot of pain for their families. Yes, but remember, I, I mine are vetted, and they're they're all at the end of a therapeutic process, so they're not at the beginning of it. I'm getting them; they'll harken back to steps along the way, and if they stay in some sort of self-deprecating loop of what a jerk I was or what a waste mm -hmm. of a life, and so on, um, th their their earlier guides. We'll shake them up and say, if you want to keep talking that way, we're leaving. You know? uh, <laughs> Where <laughs> you don't need our help to do that because you can do it all by yourself. But if you want to stop with that kind of talk, uh, we'd like to get you thinking about something else. Here's something new. Mm -hmm. As a confessor in the Catholic Church, we're trained to listen to people who accuse themselves of wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will come into a confessional conversation and accuse themselves of things that are not their fault. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they just come from family networks where they were told everything was their fault. Yeah, right, from childhood, and and well, so have a skewed idea of that. Yeah, like that that one. Um, I don't remember his name, but he felt so guilty because he had talked this other person, this friend of his, into taking this plane, and then the plane crashed. Yeah, that was a woman, uh, but yeah, she, yeah, I, I told her, I said, for heaven's sakes, uh, back, uh, when that one happened, I used to travel a lot and I had, I have a, a binder not very far from here that has all of my flight arrangements all in a row. And I had like six of them. And mm -hmm. I said, any one of these could be a plane that crashes. Mm -hmm. All you did was buy a, a very unfortunate plane ticket. Can mm -hmm. you just forgive yourself for being unlucky? Mm -hmm. uh, and people don't always want to be talked out of their um, certitudes. You know? right. Well, it was some kind of antique plane or something. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. But um, uh, sometimes I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll be a little hard on them and say, if you want to continue to be miserable, you're with the wrong person because I don't do commiseration. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a shoulder to cry on and I never have been. So mm -hmm. go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I, I tease them because I love them, but, uh, but I think you can do more than commiserate. And I, yeah. I believe I can help you do better than that. Um, yeah. Have any souls mentioned previous lives or impending lives? Um, no, they haven't. No? Hmm. no. Well, they know about their own life. They know that it has a future and they begin to go in the direction of you know, what it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, in my own reading, I'm doing a lot of reading on that topic about uh, soul clusters and uh, mm -hmm. pre-life planning and uh, and things like that because it's it's not how I was raised, and so I'm yeah. trying to learn more about it. Uh, but yeah. 
but no, it, in answer to your question, simply, no, it hasn't come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, salt clusters is a term that is used um, in a very good book that I might recommend if you're not familiar with it called A Journey of Souls by Michael Newton. Hmm, okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk after this and maybe I can. He was, um, he died. Um, he, he was a, a, hypnot a, a hypnotherapist, atheist, completely, you know, didn't believe in anything. And, but he would regress people to early childhood if they had, you know, some kind of phobia or something that might be explained, you know, if they could go back far enough in their lives. And one day he was doing that and he um, regressed at this person and he said, can you go back a little farther? And the person started describing um, the time before they were born, when they're getting ready to be born. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he couldn't believe it because he didn't believe in that, you know, he, right. he but he he knew that the person couldn't be lying because or imagining it because they were in deep trance. It wasn't a light trance. It was a deep trance. And so, you know, he was intrigued and he started asking for subjects among his clients uh, who would be willing to go back in between lives and describe what they experience. And, and he wasn't interested in previous lives. He wasn't interested in the tunnel experience or, you know, the immediate after death state. He was just interested in what comes after that. And one of the things that they report very consistently is finding their uh, cluster group. Mm -hmm. And the cluster group is the group of people who, with whom they have the most affinity. You know, sometimes in our family, we might have affinity with our parents or we might not, you know, but this is like, you know, it's kind of, I think he describes it as your true family because it's the people with whom you have the most affinity. And when they, uh, you know, when they cross over and they, and they see that group of people, it's like this tremendous rejoicing. Um, yeah, and he uses that term cluster group. Well, people are, you know, kind to me, like you are. I mean, you're listening to fantastic stories and, you know, it's up to you to decide whether you believe them or not. And I, I, uh, I'm doing a lot of reading and, uh, and, and people keep sending me different things. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm open to that possibility. There's the, the world is, the universe is awesome and mysterious mm -hmm. and knowable and unknowable at the same time. Mm hmm. Yeah. I would think that uh, um, I, I like one of the things that you reassure the reader about is the fact that we never die alone. I think yes. that's so important to, to know, even in the most sudden and traumatic deaths. Would you talk a little bit about that? I have a favorite one. Um, I think it's in the second of the two books. Um, a woman showed me being uh, frail and elderly on her couch when intruders came into her home and she was killed, mm -hmm. uh, which you would think would just be, you know, horrific. She was the sweet old lady who had, she had f fallen and broken some ribs. And so she was even less mobile than she had been before her fall. Um, and she lived on a dirt road. I think it was in the Pacific Northwest. And she said it was a black man and a white woman, and it looked like trouble. There was a, there's a lot of um, of, of uh, drug activity in the forests in Northern California and through Oregon and and uh, uh, in the Northwest. And um, she just she, she thought she was in trouble. And in fact, she said it took nothing to push me over, and that's all. It, uh, mm -hmm. That's all I did. Uh, and that, but she said uh, I didn't know my guardian before that. Uh, she said, I was a church woman, but it got too hard to go to church. And so, but she said, I was a church woman. And my, uh, when, when I, when I hit the floor, um, my guardian whooshed me up and brought me up above my roof and below the trees hmm. and said, um, now, um, 
something bad just happened to you, but what I need you to do is think of yourself as being a dog that just went for a swim. And I want you to shake real hard and shake off everything that just happened. Mm. And so she did that. And then she said um, he's, that he spoke to her and said, I'm, I'm your guardian. And uh, I'd like to take you away from here because it's unpleasant. Mm-hmm. Place where you were just murdered. <laughs> it's it's mm-hmm. unpleasant. <laughs> a little mm-hmm. bit of an understatement is that it's unpleasant here. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to take you away from here. I wonder if you would mind getting on my back and I'll fly us out of here. And she, she said it reminded her, she said, I would never in my life have done this, but I had seen a television show about tandem skydiving mm-hmm. where somebody that doesn't know how to skydive gets on the back of somebody that does and then jump out of a plane. She said, I would never in my life have done that, but it kind of felt a little like that, but mm-hmm. he was very kind and he was right. It was unpleasant. <laughs> and yeah. I didn't have any other offers. <laughs> and so I said, yeah. I'll... And, and then she said, it felt a little bit like Superman, mm-hmm. like I was uh, on his back. And then when it came time for her to actually do her crossing, um, we, we did, we used the story, uh, you know, can you think of anybody who died before you did, who loved you? And she said, I absolutely can. It's my, my younger sister, Celie. I've been talking to her photograph for 40 years. <laughs> she died a young woman and I've been talking to her photograph for 40 years it would be Celie my sister and uh, so we said okay well let's say a prayer and see if Celie is available and and, uh, can come and help you and as soon as we did she said oh my heavens look at her uh Mm -hmm. what are you seeing and she said well she always had this this uh fantasy that she'd like to be a stewardess and it was back in the days in the early fifties when they wore, look, she, she struggled with the word epaulets, mm-hmm. you know, a little decor on the shoulder that could make a stewardess look like she was a captain. And she said that it was back when they made them all be thin and they had these tight little belts and, and these sexy little outfits. And she mm-hmm. said, she's up at the top of the stairs. It's the kind of plane that you have to walk up into. And she has an umbrella drink ready for me. <laughs> <laughs> But she um, said, just a little bit of girls having fun, but I know it's my sister and I know she'll take me to a nice place. So we called her uh, Celie the stewardess. Uh, uh, yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, it is. Um, do, you, do you receive requests any other way besides being contacted through dreams? Not in a uh, kind of, spiritual gift kind of way. I mean, I get, once people know about me, they, they want me to contact their relatives and stuff. And, and I just say, well, no, I'll help you grow your own gifts. I'll teach you ways that Catholic Christian people do this in case you don't even know that. Mm -hmm. Um, But no, I'm around a lot of people. Both of my sisters have spiritual gifts that are different. One of my sisters says is a medical intuitive. Mm -hmm. At least sometimes she'll just know that somebody's in the grocery store aisle is about to have a heart attack or mm. she was at a mass where I uh, live. And she said, the lector has cancer. <laughs> so, oh, boy. Um, uh, mm. But no, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, stay in my lane. I just have, mm-hmm. this, have this one little area and that's what I do. I mean, I, I help with, with some other stuff. I've done a little bit of stuff with, uh, with people who live with a ghost. Uh-huh. Uh, sometimes I can, I can ask them to tell me more about that and uh, and suggest how I might how they might try something they haven't tried yet. Mm-hmm. For them to contact the ghost or pray for them. Or... Yes, and uh, and to be respectful. Uh, sometimes people uh, on television, there's some of these channels that are very exploitative of ghosts. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the you know the the spooky hotel or the you know some I don't know yeah it's they're, in a lot, they're, they're in basements a lot of time in the dark you know <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. but oftentimes uh, disembodied spirits earthbound spirits are treated like they're termites or yeah. old or something like that needs to be gotten rid of mm-hmm. and I just say nobody wants to be treated that way and right. if, as long as you're safe I always ask her do you feel safe. And if you don't, well, then we need to get you safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but, uh, but if you're safe and you're with somebody, 
uh, then you might be begin to pray for them and mm-hmm. and encourage them that they're you know that if they can get over being afraid that there's a better place for them and maybe you can um, point them toward it right. or get somebody to come for them and suggest something um do do these um, people ever talk about things that near-death experiencers talk about like a life review um you know seeing uh angelic figures beings of light that kind of thing uh you mean as experiences they had right at the time they left the body yeah right after leaving the body typically not um they talk about their angel because their angel ends up being a part of their healing team Mm-hmm. and so they get to know their guardian to the degree that they want to mm-hmm. uh, uh, sometimes they've had visits from relatives and loved ones often kids from school um, I don't know why but a lot of people will have a visitation from somebody they knew in elementary school mm-hmm. and it just takes them to a sweeter simpler time maybe mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. so they get a lot of visitation and they're very often told at the end of the visit, well, we can't wait until you can come with us, you know, because we're going to go shopping or we're going <laughs> we're going to go do something fun that we all enjoy. And we're, we, we're very eager for the day that you can join us. So mm-hmm. they kind of uh, they end up doing a little bit of cheerleading. Yeah. One of the things oh. that's very common is they say they they enjoy the fact that nobody's judging them. Yeah. And that's, that's very typical of the, um, uh, of the people who, rep- you know, have a near-death experience and report seeing a being of light or going through their life review process, process and, and um, feeling everything that any pain they inflicted on someone else and, yeah. you know, and also the joys, you know, that they may have. Um, caused other people to feel and they and they describe feeling it from the perspective of the other person and often they'll feel really bad about doing something and but there's always a being of light there who is radiating love and compassion and so they and no judgment whatsoever and and they're comforted and reassured by that and one part of that uh, that i focus on is truth they're Mm -hmm. shown the truth of things and not just their own mm-hmm. tiny little private truth, but the truth of how that experience affected everybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I know of that more because I'm a member of IONS. And so I'm around mm-hmm. a lot of experiencers. And I'm also a, a member of Spiritual Awakenings International that kind of spun off from IONS. So oh. I, I'm familiar with a lot of those stories because I'm around mm-hmm. a lot of those people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, I think I'm, I'm starting to get questions. Um, from attendees, so let's maybe switch over. And um, uh, Carol, would you like to ask your question out loud, or would you like me to read it? You gotta. Unmute. I'm happy for you to read it. Thank you. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm happy. To, it doesn't matter. Well, why don't I ask? I'm sorry. You're already about? talking, Carol. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, as long as your video is on, it's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, Father, I was wondering what it, what would be the difference between a ghost and a soul that hasn't crossed over? I like to answer. Uh, first of all, Carol, thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> it's an honor to be with you. The um, I, I I like to answer a lot of questions, but with I don't know. But here's what I think. Um. Oh. um They could be one in the same Um, with a, um, in the cosmology that I was taught, there are divine persons, angelic persons, human persons, and the animal kingdom. And uh, so for me, a a ghost typically belongs to the, uh, the human realm of somebody that was once in a body, but now is not, but for whatever reason is still around here. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, when I'm, when I'm dealing with that kind of thing, I'm, I'm, I really try to help the person who contacted me, which is usually the person who lives with a ghost. 
if you don't mind, it would take me about three minutes, but I'll tell you a story that that illustrates a point. I was I was contacted by a woman in Baltimore. Uh, she was actually from Puerto Rico, but she and her husband and family moved into a home in an older section of Baltimore that was kind of undergoing a revival. And she knew the minute she walked into it that there was a ghost in it. Because some people just have that facility. Sensitivity. Uh, a sensitivity, thank you. And uh, she had contacted me because uh, she felt that this, uh, that something had changed and this, um, this person was upset in ways that it hadn't been earlier. What, what she told me what happened was that she and her family needed to leave for six months and they found a house sitter for the six months that they were going to be away and they didn't tell the ghost. Oh. And the ghost was upset that now there's some yet another person rambling around in my house and she was angry and, you know, uh, causing trouble with electronics and doors and things like that. Um, and she asked for my help. And I said, well, uh, I, I go into prayer and I said, now uh, the person I was talking to on the phone, I said, can the person that you're talking about hear me while we're talking? And she said, yes, she can. Apparently they can communicate. She said, well, then uh, it turned out the woman's, the woman's name was Beulah. The ghost was an African-American woman named Beulah. And she and her husband lived at the time of redlining in real estate before, um, uh, HUD, was it HUD or the, the laws in the mid sixties that got rid of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This house was forbidden her because she was African-American. Mm -hmm. And then the laws changed and she and her husband were finally able to buy it. And it was her dream come true. Mm -hmm. So she was living in her dream home. Her husband died, but it was still her dream home. And then she died, but it was still her dream home. Right. She was a Christian. And I said, do you remember when in John's, uh, I think 15, seven, I think 17, um, Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, otherwise, why would I have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you? But, but I am, and I'll come back, and I'll take you there. I said, Beulah, what if, what if you've already found your mansion, but you could move it? What if it was on wheels or what if it had wings? What if you didn't have to stay in it in Baltimore? What if it could fly away with you? <laughs> Can you imagine that? And I said, even when people have a dream home, they usually, there's something they wish you could do, like they could do like add a back deck or have the guest bathroom redone. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to do to it? And maybe you'd like to live in it without other people in it all the time. You know, there, you, could you find, can you imagine a way for this to be your, your dream house, but maybe you'd like your husband to be able to live in it again too. And right now he can't, but mm -hmm. yeah. so anyway, we just got her thinking and she thought, well, okay, I, I'd be willing to ask. And so we just said, all right, well, she was a Christian and I said, would it be okay to ask Jesus? And she agreed to that. So we said, Jesus, if you would, would you show yourself to her? in a way that makes her feel comfortable to uh, take this dream home of hers to the next plane. And that's what happened. That is a beautiful it's story. Sweet. Yeah. She just, she had formed a thought that held her here. And all she needed to do was expand that thought. Are you familiar with uh, Ken Wilber, the philosopher? Yes. I'm not. Integral, uh, integral he's, philosopher. He, he has a phrase that he uses a lot uh, that's called uh, include and transcend. Transcend and include. Yeah. Tra is it the other way around? Yeah, transcend and include. Um, that take what's important to you, but go beyond it. You, know? mm. uh, you don't yeah. necessarily have to jettison things. Sometimes people feel like they're going to lose out a lot if they make a big change. Well, maybe not. Maybe there's a way that you could figure out. Have any of you downsized yet? Oh yeah, you know, uh, Gloria, aren't you living in a in your daughter's well, house? Well, right now I'm I'm waiting for a house to be built, so it's um, uh, it's a temporary temporarily. I'm staying with my daughter and her husband. Well, you know how it is. We we had things that were treasures once, but then we decide. Well, and now it's time for that to have a new home, or I think I'll give this to somebody. Or but then you you see some things you say, nope, that's going with me. 
Um, mm-hmm. I'm taking that thing to the next place. Mm-hmm. So sometimes that's that's all she needed to do was sort of reimagine what was keeping her here. Mm-hmm. Attachment. Yeah. Yeah. But there was a reason for it. You know, she was deprived yeah. of it unjustly for a long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, John, uh, Zeddy has a question. Would you like to ask yeah. it yourself? <laughs> My mine is a simple question. How do people crossing over describe a guardian angel? I mean, to differentiate from a passerby or somebody else. I mean, what words? They are so constant; they never leave. Even people that set everybody out and tried to create some sort of isolation chamber, their guardian will not do that. What they'll do is they'll go to the edge or the corner of whatever it is a person creates, and they'll be quiet, but they'll watch. You saw Toto, the little dog, a little while ago. We call him a watchdog because Richard, his owner, is ill. And that dog hardly will take his eyes off him. He just watches him all day long. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He's just such a sweet soul. Well, anyway, the guardians are very much like that. They just keep watch if they're not allowed to do anything else. Um, And then sometimes they can be so funny. There was there was a there's nothing funny about 9-11 and the Twin Towers. But I dealt with a man who um, he said, I was above where the plane hit. And as it got worse, I had the choice to either bring, breathe air that was on fire or air that wasn't on fire. Mm-hmm. But the air that wasn't on fire was out the window. Mm-hmm. So he chose to breathe the air that wasn't on fire, which was out the window. And he's in his imagination, he said... He, I could, I could jump, but I couldn't land. He formed the idea that I can't allow myself to land. And so, mm-hmm. of course, gravity did what it does, and he did land. But in his imagination, he was falling and falling and falling and falling and falling. And he did that for the longest time. And he said, my guardian got so tired of falling. He said, all we ever do is fall. Couldn't we please go? <laughs> Couldn't we ever go up? <laughs> Would you just stop it with the falling for a little bit? Get on my back and we'll go up for just a minute. And then you can fall some more if you need to. So they'll, they'll do what the guardians will do, whatever they can to get people to move in a positive direction, but they will not force you. They, that's just not done. It has to be up to you. Yeah. Well, you know, I, it, it could very well be that his spirit left his body before it hit the ground. Yes. Right? That's very yes. possible. But whatever, whatever his consciousness did after that, it kept falling mm-hmm. until his guardian tried to talk him out of it, at least for a little bit. Living. He was looping. He was He's trauma looping. Exactly. looping. That's, a, that's a trauma loop. And, yeah. But again, they don't come to me until they're vetted. So even if they don't feel like they're ready to move, they are. And I tell them that if they start being resistant, I just say, listen, you know, nobody gets in this line unless the people around them who love them trust that they're ready to cross. You might be more ready to cross than you think you are, but nobody's forcing you. And if, and if this doesn't work out today, that's not a problem. I've only had that happen once where somebody mm-hmm. kind of, yeah, did you ever climb up to the high dive and then climb back down? <laughs> <laughs> You can go down the ladder if you need to, you know, mm-hmm. if you're not ready, you're not ready. May I ask a short question? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, how, I mean, you, your, your experience is very unique. How, what kind of conversations you have with your peers in the, in the priesthood? I mean, how does, how do you get these ideas through or what kind of uh, receptivity you have from your peers? Uh, the ones that I live with are not that interested, to tell you the truth, that we uh, we just go about our days. And, and and it's not the only thing I do either. You know, I'm doing stuff like scripture study and counseling and other things. It's not like I do this all the time. But the but ones who do care about it, there's there's one of my brothers in particular who's a pastor. And he's, I think, three times referred to me, somebody in his congregation that's come to him with some question that he thought was better directed to me. So sometimes I'm kind of a consult. Uh, my superiors have uh, signed off on what I'm doing as true and uh, and something that they su- support me in. Um, it, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I wonder if that would be the case if you were a diocesan priest. I don't know. I, uh, I've twice been disinvited from giving talks in Catholic churches that would have been on another topic. Mm. Like when I re refer them to my website and they find I have all this activity going on, twice uh -huh. I've been told, no thanks. Uh -huh. But that's okay. I, yeah. you know, I, I try not to take that stuff personally. It's, no. I don't want to go where I'm not wanted. Okay. <laughs> and there's, I have enough to do in the course of a day that I don't need to pine away for, you know, Anything else? Yeah. Uh, Sharon, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Gloria. Um, I was wondering, are the souls always acquainted with or aware of their guardians, or is that sometimes part of the problem that they have been approached, but that they're, they're not untrusting of that relationship or something? How does that work? Sometimes they had no idea that they had one at all. Uh, like the, the sheriff that I mentioned that was shot on his sister's lawn, he had no idea that he had a guardian until that day. Um, but then he approached his guardian as uh, like a fellow civil servant. The guardian had a guardian role and so did he, sheriff. And so they could, uh, you know, they could begin, that was the beginning of a, of a, of a relationship there. They could Kind of taught, and he ended up being helped when it came time to cross. He was helped by a man on the wall. Have you been in, like, in a school where a picture of the founding class in in black and white is on the wall, or like a fraternity or anything that the the founder of this small town police department's picture was on the wall, and that's the guy that came for him. Cool. <laughs> And he recognized him because he showed himself. Uh, and sometimes they'll do that. Instead of being in full color, they'll be in black and white or sepia tone. Or a lot of times people who died in their 80s come back looking like their military picture or their wedding photo or something. Right. Um, but, uh, it, my sister had this happen not just this past week that she said Aunt Luella came and she and she looked like she did in the nursing home. And I said to her, why would you want to look old and sick? And she said, I just thought that would be the way you'd remember me. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they can do whatever they need to do to make themselves known, the guardians included. Do the guardians ever, um, I mean, it sounds like the souls are always the ones that approach you in the dreams, but do you ever get the sense that the guardians have kind of nudged them in that direction and been influential? They do, but nudge is a really good word for it. Um, because that's, they, they all, they differ in with regard to how introverted, extroverted, risk averse, uh, uh, carefree, they have full personalities that have the range of personhood associated with them. But all of them understand that in, in the kingdom of God or whatever you want to call it, in the light, um, freedom is essential. And and in their role as guardian, so is guarding your privacy. They will never divulge things that you want kept secret, even if it would be better for you if they did. They just won't. Mm. They hope they they're there to care for you. You're their you're their agent. The other day, well, actually, it was last summer. The friend with with whom I'm staying the next couple of nights, he rented an Airbnb in Santa Barbara, California. You know, during the pandemic, when hotels were too full of cooties and stuff, it's just easier to go to some house somewhere and have your own kitchen and everything. But we were there for seven weeks because it doesn't really matter. I got as long as I got my computer and the internet, I can do my work. He's retired, but we were. It was summer, and we were um, we're baseball fans. I was watching my Houston Astros on this computer, my laptop. He was watching the Boston Red Sox on his iPad. And on the wall, we were watching the Little League World Series on a flat screen. And uh, we're this, we were, I was crossing more people more quickly because I had leisure. And I just phoned some friends and said, can we, you know, can we set up another Zoom call and we'll get some more people across. And this, we were helping this one guy and the, his angel came through and the person who was assisting asked, may we know a name by which we can call you? The guardian. And the guardian said, you may call me Jake, but not from State Farm. 
<laughs> I said, oh, all right. You want to explain that, Jake, but not from State Farm? He said, yes, we, uh, we, they, they're, they're, sometimes their language is really sweet. We, 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 we seem to have come at a very propitious time. Uh, these men have a, more leisure than normal. And the line is moving faster than it ordinarily does. And so we were told we needn't go anywhere else. We could rather uh, stay close by because we would our turn would probably come up quickly. So we've stayed here among them. Now they watch adults play on the small screens and they watch children play on the large one on the wall. But whether they're watching on the small screens, adults or with a big one with children, the, the baseball is interrupted at regular intervals by Jake from State Farm. But Jake, everyone that he encounters is under the misapprehension that they are getting an unusual deal from him. And he must dissuade them of this knowledge. <laughs> he needs to let them know that everybody has these rates and that's why you should buy this product. So anyway, he went into this long thing on Jake from not, but not from State Farm, only because he felt like it. <laughs> That wasn't necessary at all, but it was funny. Anybody else have a question? I do. I do. Okay. What's your name? Uh, Natalie? Natalie. Yeah. Natalie. Natalie. So, um, so is there any way that those of us who are still here in, in physical form could be assured that um, a loved one who resisted dying and wanted to stay was able to cross over peacefully or not? I mean, or is it just uh, not possible? Well, I like I, I like to keep life simpler and and not complicate it. And if you don't know a thing, uh, don't make life harder by assuming the worst. Just, I, I just prefer to say, let's assume the best. Um, even a person that that um, resisted dying died, and everybody's accompanied, whether they want to be or not. And I believe that they can all hear what we say to them. Even if you never get the satisfaction of hearing anything back, coming back to you, you can always send. And again, in the Catholic tradition, it's intercessory prayer. It's praying for your loved one. And I just form a prayer. I teach it. Uh, you know, uh, we use the sign of the cross. Uh, other traditions have other ways to start a prayer. I believe in that it's, it's I like the sign of the cross because it safeguards the communication. You know, it's not it's not like, uh, you know, a Ouija board again or sending an email to everybody in the universe. You, you specify who you want to speak to and then just open your heart and say, hey, it's me. And I don't know how this works, but I, you know that I love you and I want the good for you. And I believe, do you know how um, we use the word current for to, to describe energy and we use the word currency to describe money? Um, I think of myself as sending people money because my dad did that for me in college. He, he opened a checking account for me when I was 14 because he wanted us to know how to write a check and how to balance a checkbook and keep track of money. And in college, he didn't like to be on the phone, but he would listen in on the extension while my mom and I talked and hardly ever say anything. But he'd get tired of it. Then he'd say, son, I'm going to go now. Is there anything you need? And that meant money. And I'd say, oh, dad, I, I think I'm okay. Or yeah, I'm a little short. I could use some help. And if I, if I said I needed some help, money would appear in my checking account. Uh, and he never asked what I used it for because he trusted that I was trustworthy. And uh, so after he died, I started sending him money. I, I just said, said, you know, I don't know what you need or what you're going to spend it on, but, but here, here, <laughs> I, I want to help you. And so I just use that as a kind of a metaphor for, I believe that we can send love uh, to others. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gloria, earlier when you were talking about uh, the question, who, do you, who died before you did, who loved you? Mm -hmm. I think all the different world religions and philosophies and schemas 
a lot of them agree upon love as being central to whatever all this is. Yeah. Uh, and any, uh, just about anybody that posits a creator uh, force or whatever would say love is uh, at the heart of it somehow. Yeah. And so I just think praying for people who have died and whatever, what, however that looks to you, mm-hmm. whatever spiritual practice you have, you, if you intend loving energy to go to them, I believe it will. And then I believe that my dad knew that money created possibilities because he grew up poor Mm -hmm. and he knew that there were possibilities when you had money in your pocket. And I I want my loved ones to have possibilities and opportunities. And so I, I just pray for them. Just a slightly different currency. Yes. A slightly different currency. And one that's, uh, I don't know, I haven't used any Bitcoin yet, but but, uh, (laughs) something that, uh, that, that that moves across time and space uh, and, when you were asking earlier about uh, drug abuse deaths, those can be complicated because uh, for one thing, sometimes they may or may not have been suicide. Yeah. Because sometimes people do brinksmanship when they're in pain Mm -hmm. and they wouldn't mind it so much if this pill did me in, but they're not exactly fully intending that it do so. So Mm -hmm. sometimes you'll have people that, that, died in something that was kind of suicide but kind of not you would think that that would be a black or white thing but it isn't right. always well drug drug abuse generally speaking is self-destructive right and so in spiritist literature it's considered a type of suicide uh. I mean, if you're if you're abusing your body to the point where you know uh you it it can kill you one of the things that's difficult for survivors especially parents who lose children to drug abuse is that sometimes they have to go back 10 or 15 years to remember them before they were an addict yeah and if that's the case it can be hard for them to imagine their loved one being whole healthy and happy because it's just been so long since they were that way Mm -hmm. so sometimes i just have to say to them um uh, don't presume that your loved one is uh, necessarily in pain um, because maybe they're not, mm-hmm. but you can certainly make things better for them by expressing your love for them and doing it consistently with some sort of prayer practice. Yes. And the prayer practice doesn't have to be the, the, the central theme of whatever your spiritual practice is, because that could be depressing. Mm-hmm. If every morning you wake up to the major theme in your life is praying for your, your child who died of drug abuse, you might need to kind of put that off to one corner, mm-hmm. make a little spot for it. But there's still, uh, there's still life to be lived and other people to care for and other things to do where you might not want that to be right in the middle all the time. Right. Okay. Um, so anyway, I just try to teach practices that I think people might be able to do. You know, uh, do any of you do yoga? Mm-hmm. Do you, uh, I, I, you're, who's, who's that? And, and Carol, you both do yoga. Do you want to be, be, be Hindus? Uh, sorry? Do you want to become a Hindu? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, m- uh, most people I know that you do yoga are just borrowing something from a, from a world tradition that is healthy and good. Absolutely. And so a lot of people, you know, haven't much use for Christianity or especially Roman Catholicism. But I'll just say, well, you don't even have to, but that doesn't mean there can't be something good within it that I might be able to point you to. Oh, yeah. You could borrow from it without having to swallow the whole thing. You know, right. there, there are some things that we do that you might find helpful. And one of oh, them, okay. I think, is we're pretty good at praying for the dead or people praying for people who have died because they're not dead. Mm-hmm. They're people who have died. Oh, yeah. Exactly. And they know you are praying for them. They do. They, they, they really do. do. They yeah. don't always. And sometimes they're asleep or unconscious. But um, I've been told, well, they make you aware of it uh, as soon as they're as soon as they're able to receive the information. You know, your mm-hmm. sister uh, keeps praying for you, you know, or mm-hmm. whatever. They're they're made to know that they haven't been forgotten, and mm-hmm. that you, that somebody here cares about their future and knows mm-hmm. that they have one, yeah. and is still trying to boost them somehow. Mm-hmm. Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I had two questions or 
wanted to know your impressions. One was in reading those uh, scenarios in your first book, and then when you went back later to talk to them again and get their permission for being in the book, it really didn't seem like very many of them had made any moves or progress or they were kind of all still in the relatively same place. And uh, I know I expect time to be the same on the other side as it is here and it's not, <laughs> but did you get that feeling like some of them just, they weren't doing anything. Um, do you, do you remember um, the young woman that uh, was in a wheelchair and dropped and killed? Do you remember that story? Yes. Tell me about it again. It doesn't ring a bell. She was uh, 24 years old and in college uh, to study. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, um, the athlete. Yeah, she was, uh, she was very athletic. And uh, she was in a car accident that made her uh, paraplegic. But she lost the use of her legs and, th- and it never came back. And then 12 years later, a dial a ride van driver dropped her. Right. And, yeah. her. and she got into the afterlife and just thought, I, I don't even want there to be one. <laughs> Life is miserable enough. I don't want more of it. Uh, but uh, she, after she crossed, she was just doing cartwheels. And oh, right. <laughs> nobody's telling me, get in here, do those dishes. So stop that nonsense. She just says, I'm just a little girl on the lawn doing cartwheels because that's all I want to do. And I'm sure there's going to be a moment where I get tired of it, but it hasn't come yet. <laughs> so she didn't feel like she needed to be productive or prove to anybody that she had really made good use of her afterlife time. <laughs> she was just doing mm-hmm. cartwheels and didn't care who knew about it. Right. It. I don't know. It seems like it's such a good opportunity to advance or, you know, learn things. Oh, I, but uh, on the other that. hand, uh, these people, a lot of them seem to be in a low vibration anyway, like a lot were angry or it was very hard for them to let go and move forward. So maybe they're kind of still like that on the other and, side. Yeah. yeah. And that they, they might just uh, be a little slower at it. But one of the things that they enjoy is they're not made to feel like the dumb kids. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that no judgment. That was lovely. Yeah. That, I see that over and over again. But then there was, do you remember Eric alone with his thoughts? The guy that died on a trail and asked her. Yes. He to come held her. back from the group. And he. Oh, right. Him. Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. And he asked for Albert Einstein. He said, uh, yes. <laughs> he didn't want his grandma. <laughs> he didn't <laughs> want somebody from first grade. He wanted Albert Einstein. Yeah, yeah. that so, was cute. Uh, he was in a rare moment in his life. He was uh, between degree programs and he was the child of two PhDs. He knew very well he was going to get a PhD, right. but he was just in a little lull at the time that he died. And, but I think he kind of sped up the pace after meeting Albert. I, that's my guess anyway. Oh yeah. He seemed like somebody that was going to loll around and do cartwheels on the lawn. <laughs> 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 he was much more involved in, in wanting to learn how the universe worked. Right. My other uh, question was, did you ever get the feeling from these people that they came to, um, was there any realization that there was a purpose to their death that way? Usually it's been the other way around that we need to, um, sometimes people get stuck that their, that their death was senseless and it needed to have meant something. Mm-hmm. And they're stuck around that idea that I died so stupidly and that I should have had a more not stupid death. <laughs> I should have had a death that was <laughs> chock full of meaning or something. And I just, or, or even shameful. Like or shameful. One, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just say to them, you know, uh, even the very first one, Ray, he was angry because God took him. Right. Uh, right. Sometimes we just say, well, didn't you know that you were mortal? Did anybody teach you that you would die one day? You knew that already, didn't you? You know, you knew that you're not guaranteed your next breath. Mm -hmm. Um, And then a bad thing happened and you died. Can't you just look at that squarely and say, that's what happened. And, Mm -hmm. and then after a while. And you're okay. And and you're you're okay. And you've got a future. And after a while, nobody cares. You're not going to spend much time in the afterlife introducing yourself to people as though at a cocktail party and saying, oh, by the way, I was hit by a bus. 
it's just not that interesting after a while. There's just so many more other things to talk about than, you know, how, the, how you left the body. Mm-hmm. But I, I guess after that sunk in for a year or two or whatever, it seems like maybe they would have come to a, they would have found some meaning in, oh, well, now I know that if I just accepted it, I would have been a lot less miserable or, you know, they would have learned something from it, but it didn't seem like, that was too much the case. We're, in the second book, we uh, uh, we took a, a, a similar approach, but we asked the question in the second book, is there anything you'd like the reader to know that you, oh. is there something that you, is there a message that you would like to convey? And several of them in different kind of language just says, kind of get over yourself. Uh, whatever happens to you, uh, just acknowledge that it did. And then, turn the page or go on or something. Uh, one, the well, body, uh, go ahead. Um, oh, go. I was just going to say, hopefully at some point they come to the realization that it was exactly the way it was supposed to be. And, and, and that they even chose, you know, from a higher level, not, not a, an, uh, a conscious level, but that uh, prior to, being born, they had chosen to exit in the way that they did. Yes, but a lot of people don't have that construct. A lot of people that you know probably do because you attract them. But Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't have much of a sense of why they're here for some grand purpose or any such. I'm saying that in the afterlife, with the help of their guides, they might come to that realization. Maybe, but not, not at the level that I'm dealing with them, because some of them just don't care about that. (laughs) I see. <laughs> they just don't care. They're they're not religious and they're not mystical or spiritual or anything. They just uh, were somebody that got in a car crash and, mm-hmm. they, don't, and they just need to move. Um, maybe there'll be a point at which they're more interested in the kind of things that we're talking about. But yeah. many times uh, it's death is very, uh, very much an equalizer. Everybody dies and all kinds of people <laughs> and they all have their own way of you know, mm-hmm. making sense of it or not even caring to make sense of it. Just letting it be one more data point that happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go read that second book because the first one was really good. Well, <laughs> I, I love them both. And they're both also in audio form. And I did I, listen to the first one. I sometimes like when I'm cooking and stuff, I have it on Audible and I, I just listen over again because I love these people. And wow. And one of my prayer partners has since died, Laura. And so I get mm-hmm. to hear her voice again. Uh, and, and then I'm, uh, there'll be a third book and I have so many stories and I'm about to start a podcast. And mm-hmm. on the podcast, I want to release some new stories from time to time. Uh, so some of these people I'm going to need to re-engage in order to get their permission. And it's yeah. just a way, you just meet the nicest people. And, yeah. and, and they're all people that obviously overcame uh, the worst coming to the worst. Hmm. None yeah. of them died peaceful, simple deaths. They all died uh, something with something awful happening, and right. they still end up having really delightful stories to tell later on. And an important point that that um, I mentioned in your introduction, but it doesn't hurt to reiterate that you make in your book is that uh, the vast majority of people who die in you know violent ways crossover just fine this yeah. is this is a small very small fraction of people who don't yes yeah um, i've also sure. met people that do this kind of work i mean you mentioned it that in your in that your community that you do something mm-hmm. somewhat similar mm-hmm. and i end up regularly a lot of europeans a lot of people from the uk canada australia new zealand anywhere that english is spoken uh mm-hmm. And even places where it isn't, uh, at least not first language, I, I end up meeting lots of people that are doing this and didn't know anybody else was doing it. Oh, isn't that and interesting? Then, oh, and then there's some, it's it's not a bad thing to have to be a, a f- official Catholic priest. There's yeah. even though they don't know me, the fact that I've been a priest for a long time, um, some of for some of them they feel that maybe you have something genuine that you could offer that might help so I, I listen to how how it works because some of them d- don't have any boundaries they don't know that they 
mine come only in sleep and only after I've invited. But some of them like have people crashing into them and sort of disturbing of the rest of their life. And I sometimes mm -hmm. will come in and teach them, well, you can tell them you're not available right now, but you'll be available later. Or you can yeah. create a prayer time or something. You can order this. It doesn't have to be random. You can right. bring some order into it. Yeah, and they should, you know, find uh, an organization that can, you know, like a spiritual center, or, you know, yes. who can train them. Yes. And uh, so that they have more control over yes. their yeah. ability. A lot of sweet people doing it. One lady's doing it while she quilts. Yeah. 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 You just told me yeah. there's something about the layers of fabric involved in making a quilt that seems sort of like the layers of, of uh, vibration or moving movement from mm -hmm. plane to plane. Hmm. Shirley, you had a question and then we got to we got to close. You had a question. Well, I was interested in, in when you say you, the people are vetted. I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, pre-approved like the, those credit card things you get in the mail <laughs> <laughs> congratulations Shirley you've been pre-approved uh, so, somebody's already uh you know looked into your finances and has decided that you're one of our kind uh well anyway that, that's somebody who's cared for these people before they ever crossed my path has said the, the this person is ready for the service that you and your prayer partners provide that's all. The guardians who work with you. Yes. That, that. And it might not have been your earthly guardian. There, there, are, there are a lot of people that loved healthcare and healing. And uh, after their deaths, want to keep doing it. And so there are ways that they can. And in the Catholic schema, the patron or patroness of something is usually somebody that did that during their earthly life. Yes. Yes. Uh, because they had a love for it and still do. And right. I'm, I've a lot of the people that work on in this therapeutic uh, early uh, lower realm are uh, people that did that here. And, yeah. And well, in spiritism, uh, the we learn that everyone has a personal guide, the guardian angel that you refer to. Yeah. But we also have work work guides. So if we're a writer, we'll have a guide who helps us write. Or if we're a scientist, we have, you know, the, the Romans used to call them muses, right? Okay. But they're, they're people in the afterlife whose um, experiences in, and interest, of course, and expertise is in this field. And they're yeah. willing to help advance things in that area on earth. In, you know. in the Catholic scheme of things, November 1st is All Saints Day. And mm -hmm. November second is All Souls Day. The the they're not canonized, but they're in the light. Mm -hmm. And I teach people how to pray by category. If you my my sister used to raise alpacas, and sometimes they'd have a difficult birth, and she'd pray for the alpaca saints. Mm -hmm. Anybody that ever helped an alpaca give birth, get over here. I need your help. Right. And, you know, yeah. Uh, I'm praying to um, for people that loved communication because I'm trying to learn how to podcast. Mm -hmm. So anybody that that during their life on earth struggled to learn some new technology or new way of communicating the message they felt that was their purpose, come sit by me, come over here. Right, right. Walter Conkite might be. Well, I, 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 hadn't asked, <laughs> I haven't asked Walter, but I, I could. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Father Nathan, for uh, giving us your time and, and, uh, talking to us about this very important topic and, and thank you so much for the work that you do sure it is badly needed likewise yes and do the thank little you all for, attending. for how to find me and all that oh and uh let's let people know how to contact you it's, it's I, I have a website it's just my name nathan n-a-t-h-a-n dash castle c-a-s-t-l-e so nathan dash castle.com if you want to communicate with me, I prefer it be email through the website. On the upper left-hand corner of the website is a little envelope icon that'll click and send you my way. Uh, I don't like Facebook Messenger or um, any other, all those other things, you know, the, the, all the different ways that people can find you. If you just email me through the website, I'm very attentive to that. And then during the pandemic, my YouTube channel has 
turned into something I'm proud of. It used to just be a dump and now it's pretty organized. So it's, it's mm -hmm. Father Nathan Castle on YouTube. And a lot of it is, inter is programs like this one. I don't know whether this will post there or not. Depends this will on. be, this will be, this is being recorded. So yeah, if you, not everybody allows that. us to post it on our, our YouTube, but if you permit that. Oh, of course. Go to my YouTube channel. Sure. And then all the, also there is stuff on like the Catholic mass and uh, Bible studies that I do and things, because there's a lot of people that used to have a, an organized religious tradition and who don't have that any longer, but uh, I help them if they threw out the baby with the bathwater, I help them find the baby. There might be something that's still in that tradition that you were raised in that you, that you might find uh, helpful at this point in your life. And maybe I have something on my website that would help with that or my YouTube channel. Great. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you All very right. much. It was well, very good. Enjoy whatever's next. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was great.